I shall start with today's message. And I want to say that 2020 has been a very interesting year. We still have two more, one and a half months more to go. You know? And, uh, and God still wants us to look forward to how 2020 will play, its, uh, will play out and then what comes in 2021. It'll be a year where we'll see that things will just take place according to God's perfect plan and will and not according to man's plan. Whether out in the world or in the church, anywhere. Amen? And so it is good. We are living in times, interesting times. I hope you all realize that. We are all living towards the day, that day. It says that day is approaching. That day. That day. Where Christ shall return as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We do not know, again I say this, we do not know when He's coming back. Nobody knows. Only God the Father. But what we do know here, is that he's coming back for the bridegroom. Amen? He's coming back for us. No, coming back for the bride. He's the bridegroom. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. He's coming back for us. He's coming back for the bride that is without spot, without blemish, a holy bride. That's what he's coming back for. And therefore, he's doing his job. God is doing his job now to prepare the church for the coming of the bridegroom. And I am excited whether I'll be seen during my time or my daughter's time, our generation or the next generation. We do not know. But well, what I do know here is that what, like what Abraham says in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11, that all our ancestors, you know, they know that they may not see that day while they're still on earth. But what it says is that their eyes are set upon the new heavens and the new earth. Their eyes are set upon the new Jerusalem. Their eyes are set upon the plans of God for them, the future. But they still continue to hold on to the promises of God. And that's what we are supposed to do, all of us here. All of us here. So let nothing stops you, let nothing hinders you, let nothing prevents you from pursuing the promises of God in your life. Most importantly, let nothing rob you of the peace of Christ. Let nothing rob you of God's plan in your life. Let nobody, nothing robs you of your eternal life. Very important. Don't assume that you're safe forever. Even Paul says that he himself makes sure that, his, that he got his salvation lest he may fall and be deceived himself. So let's all be very mindful about that. Amen? And so here this morning, this morning, you know, as I mentioned to you last previous Sunday, you know, that, uh, you know, the, two, the previous, previous Sunday, I shared with you about the subject of offense. Offense, offense, offense. And I mentioned that at the mention of the name offense, at the mention of the word offense, people are already offended. Am I right? Such powerful word, offense, and boom, they got offended. Even before you can say anything, they're already offended by the word offense. But then our church is very good. None of us here is offended. In fact, they were so happy to hear the message. And then many of you here came to me and said, Pastor, please continue the subject of offense. Oh, I'm so happy that this church is full of love, <laughs> full of patience, long-suffering, Kindness, grace, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is here in this church, crowd of life. Amen? amen? Oh yes, better be a great amen. You need that more and more in these days to come. You need that when you read all the news. You need that. And so therefore, due to popular demand, wow, popular demand, Therefore, I'm very happy and delighted to continue to speak on the subject of offense this morning. And as I said, you, have, you, you, all of you here, you have given me a word last Sunday that this morning, 
that you are coming this morning not to be offended. Am I right? Not to be offended, including the people in the Zoom and the people that will watch in the YouTube. You will not and you shall not be offended by my message and all my messages. Instead, you shall be loving all the way through. Your heart is rejoicing because God is speaking to us about not being offended. Amen. And so are you ready? Ready? So fasten your seatbelt. And this morning I want to share with you a very common, familiar, popular story in the Bible as always. The title, I will not reveal until the end of the sermon. I hear very good. People only review the title at the end of the sermon. Only Pastor D. Red, funny one. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to review the story of M and M. M and M and M. Chocolate, ayo. You know, some people think it's chocolate. So I'm going to review this story to you. It's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Our dear sisters, Sisters Martha and Mary, M and M. Oh, they thought the pastor would give them M and M to eat. And so it says that as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to Jesus Christ and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me! And what was Jesus' reply to our dear Auntie Martha? We all know the story, of course. And then Jesus Christ, in his very gentle manner, he said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, and indeed only one for that moment of time. Mary has chosen what is better, and he will not be taken away from her. And so this is a very interesting story and we can learn many valuable lessons from this short story. And I have eight pages to share from this story and I'm going to use one hour to share from just this. 38, 39, 40, 40 only these five verses. Wow, somebody says, Ay, yo. So the first thing that we notice from this story is this, that our dear sister Martha, she invited Jesus Christ and his disciples, not only Jesus Christ, but his disciples along, we do not know how many of them, into her home. She opened her home to him and to the disciples. And so the first thing that I notice from this story is this, right? Is that Martha did the right thing. She did the right thing. She recognized the opportunity of welcoming Jesus Christ into her home. She did not want to miss that blessed opportunity to host the Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. She saw that opportunity. She seized the opportunity. She grabbed hold of the opportunity the moment it came to her. Indeed, she was a wise woman. And I want you to remember this, that there were other homes in that village too. There's not only just one home in that village. There, there were other homes who had the same opportunity like mother had. But then when we read the story, all the other homeowners, they did not initiate the invitation they did not welcome Jesus Christ into their home. I'm not sure why. The Bible never says why. So we only can make assumption. Could it be that they're too busy? They're not at home? 
or they are not willing to host Jesus Christ and his disciples because most of his disciples were fishermen, fishermen, tax collector, those who are in the world is uh, being seen as lowly people. And uh, maybe they were not hospitable people. They were not hospitable people. Maybe they do not like, they did not like to prepare meals or to clean up the place after they are gone. Maybe their hosts were too messy and, or, and did not have space for Jesus and his disciples to be seated, to have a proper meal, to sit down with them, to chat with them, to fellowship with them. Or maybe they don't believe in Jesus Christ at all. Many possible reasons we do not know. We also believe it as it is. But one thing we do know is that Mary, sorry, Martha, Auntie Martha, all right, she opened her home to Jesus Christ and to his disciples. So it was very clearly that she was very happy to do so. And so Jesus Christ and the disciples entered her house. She was overjoyed. What an honor. Oh, what a privilege to host this master. And so we can see as we read the story just now, Martha was a very hospitable person. She was a remarkable woman, a good host. She had substantial generosity, which was really good. And maybe Martha was very busy cooking her best dishes. Maybe she was cooking beef rendang. Or maybe curry chicken, because we have that this morning. We're going to have this for lunch afterward. Or maybe they, she was cooking lobster noodles, right? Brother Bart? Or maybe, you know, she was busy doing mee goreng. So Rosalie is not here in the Zoom. Or maybe she was like Aunt Sister Sally doing sweet potato cake. Or maybe she was busy doing bubble tea for e like Yvonne and Elaine. Or maybe she was doing pudding topped up with vanilla ice cream like in a, what the Lily or Sister Sally label do. So what else is being served in Crown of Life every Sunday? So aren't we blessed? Aren't we blessed that we have such awesome, awesome lunch every Sunday? Hello? I know all of you are hungry now. You know, and that's what Sister Martha was doing, preparing her best meal for Jesus Christ. And so she was so occupied, you know, with her food preparation, cooking, cleaning up the utensils, the kitchen, the wok. I don't think she used wok. Her pants and all those things, setting up the table. She was so busy making sure that her guests were comfortable and well fed. And therefore, we should commend Martha for a gift of service in seeing the needs of her guests, her friends. And then suddenly, suddenly, suddenly she realized that she was all alone in the kitchen. She was doing all the job by herself. Where is my sister Mary? Mary, where are you? Mary, where are you? Why is she not here with me in the kitchen? Why is she not helping me? Why is she not mopping the floor? Why is she not setting up the table? And she turned her head, she came out from the kitchen. Oh, she saw her dear sister Mary, so comfortable sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ, giving all her attention and the time, listening intently to what Jesus had to say. Wow. Instead of being happy to see my dear little sister having fellowship with Jesus Christ, learning, maybe going through a discipleship class. Wow, Auntie Martha got so upset. Not fair. Oh, she was so angry. She was so mad. She was so annoyed with what she saw. That Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ while she was busy working in the kitchen. And she compared her busyness with, with Mary's choice of taking that time to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. And so, Martha was, was 
offended, very smart. So Martha was offended. Here I am. I'm so very busy. But you, Mary, you are so inconsiderate. You are so selfish. You are just too much. You don't care. And so what did our dear sister Martha do? What did she do? She, she marched to her VVIP, her very, very important guest. Lord, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. The sister was there. What must she ask? Pass the message, right? But do you realize that this very common reaction from all of us too? Oh, yeah. You know, when I was doing this, I think of those times when we were small little children. And by the way, we, was, we had been young before, right? Some of you, when you've grown older, you've forgotten that you've been children before. Am I right? You were little children before. And so I was thinking that, you know, because my mother, my parents had five children, five daughters, I'm the number four, G number four, G number three. You know, and uh, of course, which children, siblings will not fight and quarrel, am I right? We will fight, we will quarrel. And so when we are not happy with either brother or sister, you know, or we think that we are being bullied, what do we do? What do you do? You, what do you do? You march to your father or mother and you cry and then you complain to your parents that your sister or your brother bullied you or they're not helping you. You complain and you murmur and then you're hoping that either your father or mother, whichever you can, you can, uh, you know, you can persuade because you know who to uh, bully also, your parents. All right? You know, then you hope that your parents will side you and scold your brother and sister. Am I right? And so this is what Martha did. She did that. Very smart. She's a smart woman. All right? And so she did that. And maybe, you know, you or me, if you were there or when you read the story, you may think, how could Martha do that? So disrespectful. So daring. Can't she just pull Mary aside, pull her in the kitchen, and uh, if she wants to scold Mary, just go inside the kitchen and not in front of uh, everyone? Can't she just, just, just keep quiet first? You know, just do the job first? Because she's the one who invited Jesus Christ into the house. And then when Jesus Christ leaves the house, then she can scold Mary. Can't she do that? Why must she create such a drama, a scene? You may be thinking about that too. But the thing here is that, Martha was not only offended with Mary. Martha was offended with Jesus Christ also. She was offended with Jesus Christ also. Lord, don't you care? Am I right? She did not say, Mary, don't you care? Lord, don't you care? She was offended with Jesus Christ. You know, and uh, you know, many of us, as husband and wife especially, or parents of children, this thing is very, very common. All right? You know, husband and wife offended with each other, offended with each other. Parents are offended with the children. Children are offended with the parents. You know, they will, uh, just because, you know, we think that, you know, one party does not do their job, does not do their, you know, their part, in the marriage, in the family, you know, and get offended. And the one who's not doing it also get offended when they're being told off. You know, and uh, that's what is happening in most marriages. In fact, all marriages, in all families. And so we are all like Martha. Always being offended, always. And then we will also do like Martha. You know, when we become Christians, we become a bit better. And we say, Lord, 
Tell my wife, Lord, tell my husband, Lord, tell my father, tell my mother, Lord, tell my son and my daughter, always coming back home late. They treat this house like a hotel. Lord, tell to my boss, I did not tell after I got no salary. You tell boss, you tell God. Lord, tell it to my church people. And Lord, tell to my pastor. And so that's what happened in our lives. And so what I want to say here is that Martha recognized, the good thing about it is that Martha recognized that the person with the most authority, the most respected person there, the most honorable person there, the most just person there, is a person that, that she could bring her offense to. Jesus Christ, whom she welcomed him into her home, into her life. And so instead of murmuring and lodged complaints to everyone, to the disciples, instead of posting her offense at, you, at, uh, what, at uh, Facebook, at YouTube, at WeChat, at TikTok, at FaceTime, for the whole world to know, Martha was a bit more, you know, sensible. She just brought her offense to Jesus Christ. Today, when you see the social media, oh, wow, look at all the offense there. All the offense posted publicly for everyone to see. And so, Martha did a good thing. She brought her offense directly to Jesus Christ. And the other thing that I noticed when I read this story is this, that Martha, she, had, she, she, she was very comfortable with Jesus Christ. She has no problem venting her frustrations, her offense to Him. She just went straight to Him without any hesitation. She was like David, you know, David, the shepherd David and King David. David, he could go anytime. He goes straight to God. You know, don't think that David did not complain. Oh, David is also very good at complaining. Go and read the book of Psalms. He also complained. He, he did not hesitate to complain and cry before God. He inquired of him what to do, what not to do. He seeked encouragement from God. He goes straight to God. David was very comfortable in his relationship with God. And likewise here, you see Martha. She too had a very comfortable relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, and you can see that she just, you know, so easily invited Jesus Christ into her home. I will show you another scripture, another story to show you that Martha actually had a comfortable relationship with Jesus Christ. It is found in, um, all right, in John chapter 11, verse 19 to 28. And so what happened here was his brother Lazarus, died and he had been buried for four days lazarus but he, and we know that jesus christ raised him up all right even though he was already in the tomb for four days and so it says that many jews had come to martha and mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother when martha heard that jesus was coming when she heard just like the story we read just now she heard and what did she do she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. So it looked like Mary was an introvert type. Martha was the extrovert type. Am I right? Though they come from the same parents. So parents don't complain. How come I got two, two or three children? Huh? Oh, also I born one. How come this one like this? The one like that? The one like that? It's like that, like, okay? Just accept it. You know? And so he says here that when mother saw Jesus Christ at the, uh, somewhere at the road outside, all right? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus replied to her, your brother will rise again. Go and read the whole story there, because later on Mary also went to see him and Christ called for her. And so you can see that Martha, you know, she has no hesitation 
to approach, to run to Jesus Christ at any time. She was very comfortable with the Lord, very comfortable. Something that we should, we should all learn from her. And so here, back to the story, the previous story, that Jesus Christ advised Martha after she complained to him, right? So you notice here that Jesus Christ did not admonish Martha. He did not, even though she had this, she threw her tantrum, her outburst in front of everybody. He didn't say that Martha's service was unimportant. He did not say that at all. In fact, it is needed in the ministry. We need people to engage in acts of service, giving their best service to serve others. Imagine if there's no Martha, who's going to cook all the awesome meals for Jesus Christ and the disciples. Am I right? Imagine if there's no Martha in this church. Who is going to cook for your lunch every Sunday? If there's no Martha here, Miss Martha or Mr. Martha, who is going to clean your toilets? Who's going to vacuum the carpet here? Who's going to clean the kitchen, wash your plates after you've eaten, after you're so happy, full belly? Somebody to wash your plates. We need Martha's, all right? But our dear Martha, she was always, always worried and upset about many things. That's a downfall. It is okay to do many things, church. We need people to do things. If everybody just, just sit down and marry, do nothing, I go. She was always worried and upset about many things. I want to just add a few things here. I want to make it as practical as possible. Have you ever seen some people who are always worried about almost anything and everything? Have you come across such people? When you see them, the forehead says worried. When you see them, the forehead says upset. Don't come near me. You die. You go near them, you should get worried. You know, they are worried about what to eat for dinner when they have just finished eating lunch. Right? You know, they are worried about what to wear when their wardrobes are full of clothes. Clothes for winter, clothes for autumn, clothes for spring, clothes for summer, clothes for every occasion. 365 days, yet they still worry about what to wear. And there are people who are worried about, you know, where to keep their money. Oh, do you know of anyone of that? You don't know, I know. They're worried, should I bury in the ground? Or should I insert into my mattress? Or should I put the money into an empty shuttercock holder? Should I hide it in the garage? You know, sometimes you can invite me to do a treasure hunt in your house. But if you don't know where to hide your money, bring it here to me, okay? I'm full of fixed deposit, very secured. You know, and there are people who are worried whether, if they, get, whether they can get a job, a career. And after they get a job, they are worried whether, whether will they retire, whether will they able to enjoy the superannuation. They just got a, they just got a job and now they worry about retirement. And there are people who are so worried about their children. The moment they gave birth, to their babies, to their little kids. They are worried about their children's education, where to put, which school, where, to, where should, we, should we shift to, to another suburb so that we can enroll our children into their awesome school. You know, they are worried about their careers. They are worried also about whether the kids will have spouses, whether they get married or don't get married, even though this is a baby only. They are worried whether their children will have spouses, you know, that qualifies the criteria. They are worried whether, you know, whether their spouses are the spouses of their children. Are they white collar, blue collar? You know, I mean, let me say this with you. For the first time, when I heard about white collar, blue collar, you know what I thought about? 
I thought they were referring to tailors. I thought this, they're asking the tailor to sew white collar or blue collar. Seriously. Then I realized, it's talking about those people who, those who wear white collar are always in the office. Armchair executives. The bosses. Do this, do that. And the blue collar one are the martyrs. So Mary maybe wear white collar. Maybe Martha wear blue collar. I don't know. You know, and there are people who worry about the weather. They wake up in the morning, look at the weather first. You know, they are like the weather forecast people. You know, whether it will rain, it will be cold, it will be hot. And then there will be people who always worry about their weight. <clears throat> whether they put on weight or lose weight. But for your information, I have not been weighing for many, many years. The doctor asked me when I go for medical checkup, what is your weight? The doctor, I think, uh, and I always give a smaller figure. Because those, that figure was when that many years ago. But see, because I never weigh, you know, new one, so I don't know, so I use my old one. Uh. And there are people who are so worried about losing hair. Whether they have white hair, bald hair, no hair. Oh, I tell you, they are worried. They are worried about the shampoo that they must use. And so therefore, there are people who are worried. Every day, every time, their job, their full-time and their past-time job is worry. That's all. They wake up worrying, they sleep worrying, they dream worrying. All their worrying causes them to be very upset with themselves and with others. Please remember this. All your worrying causes you to be very upset with yourself and with others. And because of that, you could be easily offended. Easily offended with anyone, with anything, anytime, all the time. And so, when, uh, when people are always worrying and upset about many things like Martha, eventually they will lose sight of the purpose and the meaning of life. They will be so unhappy with life, about life. And, and when you tell them in so, so gently, sister, brother, auntie, uncle, don't worry, be happy. Things will, go out, will work out fine. And you know what happened? They get more upset with you. Because you told them not to worry when they want to worry. And sometimes I made the decision, better shut up. Better seal my mouth. You know, don't offer any advice. Or else you'll be scolded for nothing. And also there are people like Martha who would be worrying and upset about anything and everything. And now I want to share with you two very valuable lessons which Jesus Christ wanted Martha to learn from her dear sister Mary. There is something good about Mary too for that moment of time, for that situation. The first one is this. There is a time that we must put aside our works, our household chores, our busyness, just to sit at the feet of Jesus. To hear what he has to say to us, a time for us to minister to Jesus Christ and allow Jesus to minister to us. A time for you and me to grow our personal, intimate relationship with God. You see, Jesus Christ was at their home. Christ himself has set aside time to be with Martha and Mary. I want you to know that whatever that Jesus Christ did and do and will do, nothing is accidentally, nothing is by accident. Everything is already planned by him. And so when he goes into that village, he has already planned to be with Martha and Mary. But she waited for Martha to come out 
to take the initiative to invite him into a home. And so Jesus Christ, he did not, he was not just happen to be passing by mother's house or going into her village. He had planned to minister, to fellowship with Martha and Mary, to eat with them, to bless them. And so here you see, Martha, she was wise to seize the opportunity to eagerly welcome Jesus into her home. However, her worried and upset about many things had distracted her from receiving personal ministry from Jesus Christ. Personal ministry from Jesus Christ. While Mary, she seized the opportunity to sit at the Lord's feet, listening, learning what he had to say or teach her. And so, what Martha did was good, but Mary has chosen what is better. Listen to this. What Martha did was good, but in the words of Jesus Christ, but Mary has chosen what is better for the time, for the situation. Understand this very carefully. Please do not let your busyness or your worrying and being upset about many things distract you from setting apart time. Not part-time job, but setting apart your time to enjoy the Lord's company. Mary has chosen what is better. She has chosen what is better. Church, there is a time for you to put aside all your household chores, your busyness, your homework, your office work. Put it aside to come into the presence of God, to catch hold of His tangible presence. That's what Mary did. And God honors her. There's a time to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ at church, to edify one another, to worship together in the presence of God. There's a time for you to be busy out there. There's a time. And Mary, you know, she chose what is better. This was further evidenced in another event, which I will show you. It is found in John chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. Oh, this is a beautiful story. It says this, six days before the Passover, just, just before Christ went to the cross, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, the brother of Mary and Martha, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. So I believe Martha was cooking again. See, Martha served, you see here? Oh, this time around, very good, Martha. She served, she cooked the dinner in honor of Jesus Christ. None of them knew that Christ was going to be crucified. They, 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 they did not know. While well, Lazarus was among those reclining at the table, listening to Jesus Christ. And what happened? Our dear sister Mary, she took about a pint of pure nut, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Hello? Which means she knelt down, she bowed down, she laid herself at the feet of Jesus Christ, poured the fume over him, and used her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus Christ. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And it continued, of course, there will be people who will take offense. And then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Hey, that perfume is a pure nut. It's worth one year's salary. Which of you here in the Zoom, in anywhere, would take one year of your salary to buy this perfume 
this little bottle of perfume and pour it at the feet of Jesus Christ. And not only that, use your hair. Whether you got hair, no hair, use your hair and wipe the feet of Jesus Christ. Who of us will do that? Mary did that. And he says, he did not say this. Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because mm, he was a thief. He was a treasurer, the keeper of the money back. And he used to help himself to what was put inside there. Of course, Jesus Christ knew about what he did, but Christ did not say anything, give him the opportunity to repent. But Christ was watching. And he continued, what did Jesus Christ say? Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. You will not always have me. And so Mary knew how to worship God. Mary has a heart of worship. Mary, she knows the heart of God. She knows how to grab hold of the presence, the tangible presence of God. And of course, during the time Christ was there, she knew the, how to grab hold of Christ. Today, we have the tangible presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Are we like Mary, who sees the opportunity just to be in the presence of the Lord. And so I want to say here that Jesus Christ desires the worship of Mary and he also desires the productive work of Martha in the correct balance. And so I say in the blue print there, a time to be Mary at the feet of Jesus. A time to be Martha at busy work. Her workplace is called busy work. All right? It's not wrong English, okay? Happy balance. Happy balance, that's right. So there's a time for us to be Mary. Like now, you are supposed to be Mary. Afterward, lunchtime, please be Martha. Right? Please don't be merry or so at during lunch time, okay? Then all the mothers have to wash your plates. You know, and then sometimes we have this, you know, very cute conversation. Don't want to wash plates, huh? Okay, life is disposable. Oh, well, then those who are green environment people, what disposable? We wash. I, uh, disposable, so cannot. Wash plates, so cannot. I still don't know what to do. Maybe we should have lunch. No lunch, cannot, pastor. Oh, this almost seven years, every Sunday we have lunch. How can you break the tradition, the pattern? Lunch is most important. Oh, yes, I agree with you. Because when Jesus Christ, when he resurrected, the first thing is he had breakfast with his disciples. Eat. Before he went to the cross, he had this Passover meal. Eat. Oh, yes, I agree. So we shall eat all the way, all right? But please be martyrs. When we are eat. I know after eating, okay, yeah? And so here, Jesus Christ desires the worship of Mary and the very productive work of Martha in a correct balance. Number two, point number two of this story. Being worried and upset about many things have caused Martha to be offended with Mary and Jesus Christ. As a result, she could not make wise judgment on setting right priorities. Setting right priorities. The one thing I love about Sister Sally, Tan, the day I knew her, it's almost like uh, we are two years, almost four years, Sister Sally, four years plus. I remember the first time when she it was in Blue Gum, she and her Brother Peter, you know, she was, uh, Brother Peter was in this, uh, uh, what do you call that, the walker? So the study was actually pushing him. The first day I didn't know who she, I didn't know Brother Peter first time. The first thing when she opened her mouth, the first time I heard her talking is this. Why nobody tell me that this is a church here? Who are? Why nobody tell me? Because she happened to know a few of people there. Why you never tell me? You 
oh, here? Wow, che. At the time, she didn't know that I was pastor there. I said, wow, I love this fellow. Thank God she's still here with us. Thank you, Sister Sally. And there's one thing about our dear Sister Sally, which I love about her, is this. I love all of, all of you, okay? Please, uh, don't be jealous, huh? don't be offended. I love all of you. Amen. Amen. But there's one thing about her that strikes me, which, is, which she has consistently said throughout these four years I knew her, is this. When it comes to Sunday, uh, it's time to go to church, okay? My mother taught me one. A very good mother. I love her mother. Sunday is a time to come to worship God. After that, you can go anywhere you want. Wow. All right, praise the Lord. Bless her. Okay? Please don't be offended, yeah? Okay. All right. And so here you see that, you know, but because Martha was always being worried and upset about many things, she could not make wise judgment about setting right priorities. You know, the previous Sunday I shared with you from the story of King Asa and, and Commander Naaman, you know, about their pride of life. Their pride of life almost, you know, caused them, sorry, their pride of life caused them to be very offended. Their pride of life caused them to be very offended with the word of God. With the prophet Hanani and Naaman, you know, with prophet Elisha. And we know the story that King Asa, he forfeited God's favor forever by keeping his offense against God until he died. While well, Commander Naaman, a non Jew, or a non Jew, he almost lost the opportunity to be healed and restored of his leprosy. But thank God, he humbled himself before his servants. He listened to what his servants had to say. And he went into the Jordan River, dipped himself in the muddy water seven times, and received God's blessings. The opposite of pride is humility. Pride always leads to offense and then destruction. And so here, we heard the story of Ace King Asa, Commander Naaman, Sister Martha. So today's title topic, the title of today's subject is this, Making Wise Judgment. Beware of the baits of offense. Baits. For those who like to do fishing, like Brother Benny, you know, they had to use baits, right? To lure, to deceive the fishes in the water. To come and eat that little fellow there. You know, and then you get it, and then the fisherman will be happy. <laughs> Stupid fellow you, are, huh? Right? You caught the fish. Because that fish was tempted was deceived to the baits. Be very careful. The baits of offense. That, that Sunday, the previous Sunday, I mentioned about offense being the stumbling block from making wise judgment. And so, in this story, King Asa, Commander Naaman, and Martha, we learned this. We learned that, you know, that pride of life, worried and upset about many things, can stumble us from making wise judgment, from setting right priorities. Pride of life, worried and upset about many things, prevent us from receiving personal ministry from Jesus Christ, the Word of God. Pride of life, being worried and upset about many things, forfeit us of God's continued blessings. These are the baits of offense, which we all go through, but we'll be very careful. Beware of it. Don't let that eat into you. Stop it. Stop it. So we must not allow pride of life, worries, being upset about many things, with many things, with many people, which cause offense, to stumble us from receiving and exercising godly wisdom. We must not allow the base of offense to cause us from being able to discern priorities of life. We must have God's wisdom to set right priorities in order 
to receive God's continued blessing. And now I will close. I will close with the key learnings from the story of the person of Martha and Mary. All right? M and M. So that is the story of M and M. So the first M is Martha. All right, Sister Martha. So the key lessons that we can learn from, Ma from Martha is this. She, she seizes the opportunity to welcome Jesus Christ into her home. For that, five star, 100%. Very good. And she loves serving the Lord and His people. Five star, 100%. Very good. However, she allows worries to upset her, leading to offense. Lord, don't you care? Offenses causes her to not be able to prioritize correctly. Offense causes her to miss the opportunity to receive personal ministry from Jesus Christ. However, she brings her offense directly to Jesus Christ, the shepherd and the overseer of her soul. For that, very good. That was Martha that we can learn from her. Now, what about Mary? What about dear sister Mary? Jesus Christ says that Mary has chosen what is better. The key thing about Mary is this. She seizes every opportunity to be at the feet of Jesus Christ. Every time that she had the opportunity with Christ, she would be sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ. I'm giving you here three stories here. Which, the first one which we heard this morning, that she received a personal ministry from Jesus Christ, Luke 10, 39. The next one, we are sharing with you just now too. So she said God's grace and mercy, that when she saw Jesus Christ going to the house, when Lazarus has died, it says that she fell at his feet. Go and read John eleven thirty two. 32. She fell at the feet of Jesus Christ. Again, when she saw Jesus Christ, she fell at his feet. And just as we read, she worshipped and, and she knows how to worship and adore God. She poured the perfume at the, at the feet of Jesus Christ and she wiped his feet with her hair. And so that was Mary, a lady whom Christ mentioned about her and spoke about her numerous times in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the Gospel, that she sees us every opportunity to be at the feet of Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage all of you here, please be Mary at the feet of Jesus Christ. There are times, and there will be many times, you should be Martha. But can it be that on the Sundays, if Sunday is a Sabbath day, because Sabbath day can be any day, because Jesus Christ says that He's the Lord of the Sabbath, which means every day is Sabbath day. Every day, every day we rest in God's presence. Every day, Sabbath means resting in God's presence. If you choose Sunday to be a Sabbath day, can I encourage you that commit Sundays or, five, or Friday or Saturday, whatever day you choose, just to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. Put aside all your busyness. Don't let anything to distract you. You need to rest in the presence of God and grab hold of the tangible presence of the Lord, your Master, your Savior, your owner. If you want to prevail and to be an overcomer in this world here, you need, you need to enjoy the Lord's fellowship. You need to enjoy the Lord's company. This is my prayer for all of you here. God wants you to enjoy Him. God wants you to have a personal relationship with Him where He can minister to you directly, personally. Amen.